Salawat. Salawat. Allahumma. Um, we'll, we're now starting the main program with a recitation of Quran from Maya Masari. Salat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. قال لن أرسله معكم حتى تؤتون تأتون موثقا من الله لا تأتونني به إلا أن يحاط بكم فلما آتوه موثقهم قال قال الله على ما نقول وكيل وقال يا بني لا تدخلوا من باب واحد ودخلوا من أبواب متفرقة وما أغني عنكم من الله من شيء إن الحكم إلا لله عليه توكلت وعليه فليتوكل المتوكلون ولما دخلوا من حيث أمر أمرهم أبوهم ما كان يغني عنهم من الله من شيء إلا حاجة في نفس عقوب قضاها وإنه لذو علم لما علمناه ولكن أكثر الناس لا يعلمون ولما دخلوا على يوسف آوى إليه أخاه قال إني أنا أخوك فلا تبتئس بما كانوا يعملون فلما جهزهم بجهازهم جعل السقاية في رحل أخيه ثم أذن مؤذن أيتها العير إنكم لسارقون صدق الله العلي العظيم Today we're very fortunate to have Dr. Chris Moffat who will be speaking to us on the topic of India's revolutionary inheritance, politics and the promise of Bhagat Singh. Um, Dr. Chris is, is a political and intellectual historian of modern South Asia with an interest in the shape and form of history's public life across the broader post-colonial world. His work engages both with the philosophy and anthropology of, dis of the discipline. Um, he joined Queen Mary in 2015, having, create, having completed his PhD at the University of Cambridge in 2014. Um, he's written extensively on, on the revolutionary Marta Bhagat Singh, uh, and um, from 2017 to 2020, he's, um, uh, uh, and recently he's, his research has explored the contested status of the past in Pakistan's uh, polit politics and public life. He focused on the role of the built environment in mediating relationships to history, charting conflicts uh, over the construction, conservation and destruction of buildings in Pakistan's uh, major urban centers. Uh, his, his research will uh, then appear in a book manuscript provisionally titled Learning from Lahore, Architecture After Modernism in Urban Pakistan. Thanks so much, Mehtad, I really appreciate it. And thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to come here and um, give this talk today. And thanks also to my friends, Kasha and Mehtad, for um, the original invitation and for the kind of interest in, in my work and this opportunity. So um, I was asked to, s to say a little bit about my um, book, which I guess, does the PowerPoint come up? Oh yeah, there it is, sorry. Um, my book, India's Revolutionary Inheritance, which came out um, about a year and a half ago. Uh, the book centers on the 1920s anti-colonial revolutionary Bhagat Singh, who I'll say a bit more about in a moment and who some of you may know. Um, but I'm also interested in this historical figure as a case study for thinking about afterlives in politics, right? Um, the afterlives of anti-colonial revolution in particular. So what do I mean by afterlives? Something kind of like legacies, but something that's a bit more um, active or disruptive, right? A little bit more unpredictable. I argue in my book that Bhagat Singh, who was as a revolutionary executed by colonial authorities at the age of 23 years old in 1931, I argue that 
even though he was killed um, 90 years ago, uh, he continues to have an impact on politics in India today. And the book is about exploring what that impact might be, how we might understand that, or how I might understand that as a historian, but also more generally, right? And so I'm interested in what I talk about as the politics of inheritance. Um, this way in which the living, right, uh, have a sense of responsibility or duty to uh, the dead or to those who um, they owe some sense of uh, responsibility or honor a debt, right? And afterlives, thinking about afterlives in politics is not limited to Bhagat Singh. Um, and so I'm hopeful that in the discussion that um, will follow, we can explore this further. And I'd love to hear um, some of your own ideas about uh, how we can think about the way the past interacts with the present and how we can think about how heroes or martyrs from the past continue to um, have an effect on, 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 on us today. So I guess um, I'll speak for around 25, 30 minutes. Um, and then I'd, I'd love to have a bit more of a conversation. I'm happy to also answer any more specific questions you might have about Bhagat Singh's life. Um, but I'll start by saying a little bit about Bhagat Singh. Um, so in this photo, which you see uh, uh, on the screen, Bhagat Singh is 20 years old. Uh, it was taken in 1929 in a studio near Kashmiri Gate in Delhi. And Bhagat Singh was born in 1907 in uh, a village outside of Lialpur, which is today's Faisalabad in, in Pakistan. Um, his mother was a Sikh, his father was an Arya Samaji. Um, and he would move to Lahore uh, as a student to, to study, but was eventually drawn into the kind of politics of his day, um, the kind of uh, politics of anti-colonial um, opposition to British colonialism. Right? So his stage on... Uh, or his appearance on the stage of anti-colonial politics was a very brief one, right? He was part of this wave of radical youth action uh, in the late 1920s, and he helped found an organization called the Hindustan Socialist Republican Association, the HSRA, and he, he did this in 1928. And the founding of this organization was informed by two general developments, right? One of which is the emergence of uh, a mass movement of uh, opposition to British colonialism um, led by Gandhi in India, right? Um, but also a disillusionment with Gandhi's commitment to nonviolence amongst the section of the youth population, right? An idea that Gandhi was um, too committed to nonviolence and he was, he was preventing a revolution, right? And the second development is this global uh, development of um, the Bolshevik Revolution, right? In 1917, the, um, the coming to power of a communist government in Russia, um, which is seen by a lot of young radicals in India at this time to be uh, an indication that another type of world is possible, right? Another type of politics is possible. So due to these two kind of um, global figures, Gandhi and Lenin, we see um, uh, the, the Bhagat Singh's politics forming on the, in, in colonial India. So a few months after the Hindustan Socialist Republican Association, the HSRA, is founded in December 1928, um, Bhagat Singh was involved in the first uh, action of this revolutionary group, which was the assassination of a police officer in Lahore as revenge for uh, the Punjab's police um, breaking up, a violent breakup of a peaceful protest in Lahore. And then in April 1929, which is four days after this portrait was taken, Bhagat Singh and his, his comrade Badukeshwar Dutt um, would throw a bomb into the Legislative Assembly in New Delhi at the very moment that the colonial government, um, this is the Legislative Assembly is kind of the heart of, of the British colonial government in India at the time, um, at the very moment they were passing legislation to crack down on trade union legislation. Right? So the bomb was designed as a spectacle, no one was killed. Um, it was thrown alongside pamphlets which quoted uh, a French anarchist, Auguste Vellant, who said, it takes a loud voice to make the deaf hear. Right? It takes a loud voice to make the deaf hear. Um, Bhagat Singh and Dutt both immediately surrendered themselves to the police. Uh, they aimed to use the 
courtroom as a, a platform to spread their revolutionary ideas. Um, and indeed, that photograph which I showed you was taken as part of a kind of publicity campaign. So a copy of their manifesto and these images was delivered to newspapers all around Delhi um, at the time of the bombing. Um, eventually, Bhagat Singh was tied to this earlier assassination of a police officer in Lahore. He was sentenced to death and he was uh, hanged on the gallows in Lahore Central Jail in uh, 23rd March, 1931. Okay? As I said, he was 23 years old. So this is an image that was circulated after the execution, and it gives you kind of an idea of how Bhagat Singh was, was remembered at the time, or how he was being invoked at the time as this kind of um, patriotic figure who is giving his head to Bharat Mata, to Mother India, right? And uh, in this sort of... Um, uh, popular idea of self-sacrifice. So the brevity, this kind of short period of Bhagat Singh's political life, he founds this organization in 1928, he's executed in 1931, he has a very short time on the, the stage of anti-colonial politics. The brevity of this political career contrasts very sharply with his extraordinary popular afterlife uh, in India. Um, dislocated from these partisan politics of 1920s India, Bhagat Singh is, stands in the 21st century as, as an icon of, of self-sacrifice, of uh, an injunction to stand against tyranny, um, to never back down, to never surrender. He's kind of seen as this, this courageous figure, as some of you will, will know. And he's routinely invoked, not only by a kind of revolutionary left, um, but also by uh, uh, the, the religious right, by the army in India, to pacifists in Pakistan, uh, environmentalist youth groups, to Khalistani secessionists, right? So he has this kind of broad appeal across the political spectrum. Um, there are statues of Bhagat Singh across India, mostly in North India, um, as some of you, uh, again, may know. Um, there is the one on the left is uh, a kind of monumental sculpture in the Lok Sabha in, in Delhi, interestingly put up again outside the building that he threw a bomb into uh, many years earlier. But then you also have these smaller um, statues in, in, in chalks, village chalks, um, which are kind of maintained by community organizations. So biographers of Bhagat Singh or historians of Bhagat Singh have not taken well to this sort of um, widespread popularity across the political spectrum, right? There is a feeling that because he means something to everyone that people are not understanding him correctly, they're not reading his writings, right? That it is a sort of distortion of the, the ideas of one of India's most significant revolutionary thinkers, right? So there's been a great deal of effort to uh, write the history of the real Bhagat Singh, right? To say who he really was, what he really fought for. So was he a communist? Was he an anarchist? Um, was he an atheist? Did he remain a Sikh, right? And I think this is all really important work. Um, there has been uh, a great deal of effort to kind of recover a lot of his writings which are lost over many decades. Um, it's not been my particular interest in this history. Instead, um, I'm not trying to make a claim on the right or the wrong way to understand Bhagat Singh, but actually to think about why it is that this figure appeals to so many different types of politics in India today and what that tells us in the first place about the meaning of these histories of anti-colonial revolution, what these histories mean today, um, but also why there is a kind of continued appeal to this brand of uh, self-sacrificing, uncompromising politics uh, in India today, right? This kind of romantic uh, um, revolutionary. Why does he continue to appeal to, um, to especially young people so many years after his, his death? So this is why the book um, is, the subtitle is Politics and the Promise of Bhagat Singh. So I'm less interested in the kind of program that he writes um, his program for politics, then the sense of potential, the promise of this figure, right? So today I wanted to, to talk a little bit about this and suggest why I think it's important for me as a historian to 
think of the past not as something that is, you know, behind us, that is over and done with, but actually um, something that has deep and meaningful consequences for how we think about the present and about our, our lives today. So for me, this is less a question of what lessons do we learn from the struggles of the past, but how do these struggles from the past kind of repeat on the present? How do they continue to force us to raise questions about uh, contemporary life and contemporary politics? Right? Um, and specifically also, what is our responsibility or what is the responsibility of living generations to those who fought against injustice or oppression? Um, in, in, in the past and how do we connect those struggles to the present. So this is again all by way of background to my interest in this idea of afterlives, right? Those after effects of history, those long-term legacies. And I think it's useful to distinguish between two ways of thinking about afterlives. And I do this kind of um, speaking again as a, as, as a historian. One by looking at the way that politicians willfully invoke um, figures from the past. So they, they will appeal to past heroes or villains as, as symbols or, um, uh, yeah, symbols to serve their politics in the present, right? But the second more provocative possibility that I'm interested in is the way in which figures from the past can actually demand something of the living, right? And that maybe seems a little bit obscure, but this idea that there is um, the, the kind of dead generations, these kind of uh, heroes of the past, um, make a demand on the present, right? And this is the difference in my work where I talk about this kind of invocation or reception versus the idea of being haunted by the past, right? Haunted by history. And by this, I don't mean that there are actual ghosts, right? I'm not saying that we actually have to believe in Bhagat Singh as this ghostly figure who's haunting us, but actually to challenge our idea that the past is separated from the present, that there is this kind of ordered sequence of past, present, future that we can follow, and look instead to this experience of repetition, of return, and how we think about history, right? So Bhagat Singh, for me then, is not just a symbol, he's not just a kind of figure from the past, but he is uh, someone who appears time and time again as an effective and demanding interlocutor, a kind of person in conversation with the present, right? Even 90 years after his death. So he's effective because his ideas, the cause for his fight is still seen to be relevant today, right? Relevant to the struggles of today in India and beyond. Um, and he is demanding, so I said he's an effective and demanding figure. He's demanding because those who do celebrate him, uh, the figures I was, I was mentioning, or that I showed on the screen, often experience his memory or his presence as a call to responsibility, right? As the sense that something is owed to Bhagat Singh for his sacrifice, right? And this is because his revolution is seen to be unfinished. What he kind of devoted his life struggle to is seen to be um, un unfinished or the freedom that he was said to have fought for has been compromised or betrayed in some way in, in India today. So the question for me then is how can we think about politics and the struggles and disputes of the present? Um, how, how does our understanding of politics change if we admit figures like Bhagat Singh into it? If we say that Bhagat Singh is our contemporary rather than our uh, antecedent or ancestor, right? So this is a particular question about um, revolutionary afterlives and the idea of an unfinished revolution. But there's also something very particular about the example of Bhagat Singh, and, and this is tied to uh, the nature of his death, right? The fact that he was um, hanged uh, on um, uh, 23rd of March, 1931. So as I mentioned, Bhagat Singh was... Um, executed for conspiring to wage war against the king emperor. That was the charge, conspiring to wage war against the king emperor, right? Um, his hanging came at the end of a very long court case, the Lahore conspiracy case, uh, which was characterized by his continuing defiance of the authority of the court, right? 
Uh, and this is part of why he became such a popular national figure, right? In the first place, he owned up to everything that he had done. He accepted the charges against him. He said, yes, I have, you know, um, waged war against, against the empire. And he actually invited, he, he, he asked to be shot as a prisoner of war rather than hanged as a criminal. Right? So he's kind of tempting the authority of the court there. Um, he did repeatedly contest the court's claim to represent justice. So he was questioning the British authorities' uh, role as a representative of justice. And um, I think, um, you know, he used this trial as a stage to make speeches, to shout slogans, to denounce British rule. Um, and all of these actions were recorded very um, eagerly by the nationalist press and reported across the country, which is why you have this kind of popular energy around Bhagat Singh. And it's also important to note this was a very kind of swaggering, uh, masculine performance, right? Bhagat Singh is described in accounts of the time as kind of twisting his mustache in defiance of the judge, right? Getting into fights with prison guards, uh, remaining a totally uncowed by the threat of state violence against him. And indeed, when the death sentence is announced, I've already said that he invited, you know, a firing squad. But when the death sentence was announced, he actually thanked the judge for this opportunity to prove his commitment to his revolutionary ideals, right? So you kind of get a sense of um, how this figure, how Bhagat Singh appears as this defiant, courageous figure. So his hanging in Lahore Central Jail provides the centerpiece of, of my book. And I, I thought I would just read a kind of very short um, extract from it now, which covers the execution. Shouts emerge from jail, reported the Lahore Tribune following the events of 23rd March, 1931. Bhagat Singh, Rajguru and Sukhdev executed. So Bhagat Singh was executed alongside two other revolutionaries, uh, Sukhdev and Rajguru. The government's attempt to avoid a public spectacle around the controversial hanging, shrouded under a thick veil of secrecy, censored by prison walls, and carried out ahead of the scheduled date, was subverted, it seems, by a loud noise heard from outside the compound. Not a howl of suffering, but one final shout of defiance. In Kalab Zindabad, or Long Live Revolution, the prisoner's last testament, delivered from the stage of the gallows. The prison walls, quote, reverberated with the slogan, suggests Gopal Thakur in his retelling. The musician and scholar Madan Gopal Singh recalls a story passed down by his father, the poet Harbhajan Singh, describing the family's ancestral village of Itra on the night of the hanging. So Itra was then the closest habitation um, to Lahore Central Jail. Like most of the district, the village was, quote, agog with excitement on 23rd March, charged with rumors of the impending execution. After the fall of darkness, the tension was broken by distant echoing shouts of in Kalab Zindabad. Groups of villagers gathered on rooftops in stunned silence before beginning steadily to return the slogan into the night. In Kalab Zindabad, in Kalab Zindabad, Madan Gopal imagines the scene. And here I'm kind of quoting from Madan Gopal Singh. Their sound is picked up by the inmates of the jail and reciprocated. The atmosphere now becomes fully charged. Hindus, Muslim Sikhs rise as one primal sound and the night is torn asunder. This impassioned expression of solidarity between the prison mates and the villagers continues late into the night. Not a lamp is lit anywhere in the vicinity, whereas the distant jail seems to burn like an island of light. So in this telling, the resolve of Bhagat Singh and his comrades in the face of death is contagious, right? It sparks this rising chorus between the villagers and the prisoners. This death is not to be greeted with a mournful silence. It demands a response, the escalation of a fight. So the central premise then is that Bhagat Singh is not some irrelevant figure from uh, another time, but someone who continues to haunt the present as a sense of potential unfulfilled, of a revolution left unfinished. And Bhagat Singh's eventful afterlife is enabled because he was not just an anti-colonial 
figure, not just an Indian nationalist, but he was a revolutionary, right? A critic of the state. And this is important because I think it facilitates an ambivalent relationship to that moment of Indian independence in, in 1947. And this year, the transition from colonial rule to post-colonial, uh, the post-colonial state is commonly purported to be the kind of end of one historical sequence and the beginning of another. So the end of colonial India, the beginning of a free nation. But we know from Indian history that um, this was also a moment of uncertainty, of, of unfinished business, as I talk about it in my book. And there's been debate about how much this transformation, the nature of the freedom achieved, um, dealt with some of those inequalities of, um, of, of caste, uh, of gender, of, um, of class um, that were fought against as part of the anti-colonial struggle, how much it resolves these issues, right? And this is perhaps most clearly articulated in the early Communist Party of India slogan, Ye Zadi Juti Hai, right? This freedom is a lie. But such dissatisfaction with independence was not the sole province of a kind of revolutionary left. We also know that Gandhi was assassinated by uh, Nathuram Godse, this um, Hindu nationalist who was dissatisfied with um, the creation of Pakistan, who, who, was kind of dis, uh, who saw independence as a certain sort of betrayal, right? But the point I'm making then is if 1947 did not establish the future that Bhagat Singh is seen to have fought and died for, it did not accomplish the revolution he set out for, then we can still see his, his example as, as having some sort of force. So I, I talk in the book about this idea of being halfway to freedom. Right? And I take the idea of being halfway to freedom from a 1980 novel by um, Rudula Garg, the, the Hindi novelist, one of India's foremost Hindi novelists, um, entitled Anitya, or The Dispossessed. And in this book, Garg's protagonist is, is literally, in a sense, ha haunted by Bhagat Singh. So there is a ghost in this story um, of Bhagat Singh kind of um, haunting this figure who used to be uh, a student activist, uh, who had indeed gone to prison under the British, but now he is leaving, leading a privileged life in post-colonial India. He's kind of become an industrialist and he's left those struggles behind. So Bhagat Singh continues to appear to him and says, you need to take up the struggle, you need to continue what was left half done, right? This revolution unfinished. Um, so through this character and, and the ghost of Bhagat Singh, Garg explores that kind of uncertainty around the independence moment, right? Which she says in her author's preface was not necessarily one of triumph, but one of angst, uncertainty. The independence, she writes, um, was nothing more than a transfer of power. At best, we could say we had reached halfway to freedom, or was it halfway to nowhere? That's Merdula Garg writing in, in 1980. So my book is also an attempt to think about this uh, idea, this anxiety over the nature of, of, of freedom uh, and independence in India. Um, and there's this lingering question that I'm interested in amongst some of the people that I spoke to for writing the book, some of the, the organizations I was involved with about, you know, looking at the present in India and asking, is this what our heroes really wanted, right? Is this the future that they fought and died for? Um, and this is the way that Bhagat Singh then comes in as someone who's still relevant. If that revolution is unfinished, then what can Bhagat Singh tell us? Uh, and in the book, I'm interested in two responses to, to Bhagat Singh's call to responsibility. One is the response in which individuals seek to kind of contain Bhagat Singh's disruptive message, his, his disruptive legacy, and attach him to one particular political project or one particular political party, one particular idea of what the Indian nation is or should be. And this could be pursued via the writing of official histories, by building statues, um, or even the way he's depicted in, in films. And, and some of you may know there's been a number of uh, films made about Bhagat Singh that treat him as this kind of romantic, patriotic figure, right? The second um, way of responding to Bhagat Singh in the present is that of escalation, right? Those who respond to this call to take up what was left half done, to take up this unfinished revolution and, and transform it in the present. And this is most obviously seen amongst uh, left-wing student groups in India, um, many of whom claim a direct 
lineage or direct relationship to, to Bhagat Singh and the organizations he was himself a part of in 1920s Lahore, like the Najran Bharat Sabha. But the problem for some of these groups and the reason this history becomes contested is that um, the figures who seek to honor Bhagat Singh's fight by following his example are not always uh, progressive, they're not always um, uh, on, on, on the kind of le revolutionary left, but can also lean towards a kind of muscular nationalism, right? This idea of a gun-toting vigilanteism. Um, and in my book, I discuss not only Bhagat Singh's appeal to left-wing student organizations, but also the way he is invoked by Hindu nationalists and uh, Sikh Khalistani secessionists, right? Um, throughout the 1980s and 90s and 2000s, we've seen this. Bhagat Singh is this kind of... Um, you know, muscular nationalist who's willing to break the law and fight traitors and, and these kind of ideas, right? So I'll just kind of move towards uh, conclusion now, and I, I'd really like to, to hear people's thoughts and um, have a, a bit of a discussion about the politics of history. So we know that battles over history are battles over the present, right? The German theorist and philosopher Walter Benjamin famously wrote about how the historian can uh, fan a spark of hope in the past, right? That is, by looking at the history of previous struggles, we can find inspiration to conduct struggles or fight injustice in the present, right? But for Benjamin, the historian must also recognize, and I'm quoting here, that even the dead will not be safe from the enemy if he wins, right? Even the dead will not be safe from the enemy if he wins. And I think one way of reading this warning, you know, and why it's worth thinking about today in the context of a kind of global shift towards the right, um, is that this, this kind of right-wing politics involves a rewriting of history, right? It involves a rewriting of history in a variety of contexts, especially in India, also in the UK and elsewhere. Um, but looking at Bhagat Singh's effects and his, his importance in India today. I think we can also invert Walter Benjamin's phrase to say that even the enemy, if he wins, will not be safe from the dead, right? Even the enemy, if he wins, will not be safe from the dead. That the dead continue to haunt the present as, uh, you know, a reminder that things can be different, right? As a reminder that there are other things to fight for. So if Bhagat Singh calls on us to recognize that many of the inequalities and injustices that he fought in the 1920s continue today, then, or in some cases have actually increased or transformed, right? Then the question has to be how do, how do the living respond? How do they honor this legacy? So in writing my book, I, as I said, I kind of avoided making a judgment about the right or wrong way to understand Bhagat Singh. And this was important for me as a kind of early career academic, not sure how this uh, scholarship would, would be read. Um, but I think the book was written and researched largely before um, Narendra Modi came to power in India. And, and I think since that time, the stakes over the battle of, of, uh, of over history have escalated quite a bit. Um, so just in conclusion, I wanted to reflect a little bit on what I think um, Bhagat Singh's call to responsibility and his meaning for contemporary struggles uh, and movements might mean today. So for me, kind of speaking personally, this involves first uh, affirming that sort of internationalism that characterized Bhagat Singh's thought. And we know that Bhagat Singh was uh, a student not only of Indian history, but also of global revolutionary movements and his, his organizations where he's kind of constantly looking at struggles around the world to, um, in, to kind of identify a sense of solidarity, to identify inspiration for their own, right? The second lesson is to challenge these kind of monuments uh, built by power and infer, affirm that kind of potential of, of the crowd, of the protest, right? The popular assembly um, and it's democratic horizontal energies. And I think there's plenty of evidence of this latter in India today. Um, I had the privilege to be in Delhi during the Shaheen Bagh protests, which some of you will know about, were this kind of major demonstration against um, uh, repressive changes to Indian citizenship law, which was kind of initiated by a group of Muslim women in Delhi. Um, we also know that this 
protest was formed by a year-long um, uh, farmers' protest around the outside of, of Delhi, which um, was again against some kind of repressive legislation passed by the Modi government, and which some of you will know um, had a bit of good news today in, in that Modi has repealed some of those um, or is moving to repeal some of those laws. And both of those, um, I think my PowerPoint is uh, maybe disconnected here, but that's okay. Um, I had an image of Shaheen, oh, there it is, uh, Shaheen Bagh. You can see that this is a contemporary protest in 21st century India, but all the figures that are being depicted are anti-colonial figures, right? Including Bhagat Singh, um, we see Nehru and, and Gandhi as well. Um, so these protests, although they're very much about the present, are decorated with these figures from the past. And then third, um, I think the lesson of that slogan in Kalab Zindabad, long live revolution, is that even when the current fight um, ends, when laws are dropped or policies reversed or politicians changed, um, there are many more kind of struggles to come. And so uh, Bhagat Singh uh, is an example of, of this kind of call to remain ready and vigilant um, through that ethic of in in the bad long live revolution, right? A life for revolution, a life of revolution. And I think I'll finish there and I'd love to um, hear any questions or responses. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we now have time for any questions. Thank you so much for that, Chris. Um, so, as you know, like in India, when people talk about Bhagat Singh, they don't just say Bhagat Singh, they say Shahid Bhagat Singh. Yeah. And I was wondering if you've seen anybody make parallels with the story of Imam Hussein, because for, especially in the Shia tradition, yeah. it's a very similar kind of unfinished revolution, standing up to injustice. All, all those things that you mentioned yeah. are very resonant in... Uh, and that the other thing I was going to ask you is, uh, so recently in Shaheen Bagh and other places, one of the big thorns in the side of the government has been uh, somebody called Chandra Shekhar Azad. Mm. And of course, Chandra Shekhar Azad was one of the contemporaries of Bhagat Singh as well. Yeah. And, and I think even now he's planning to stand against Yogi in, in the UP election. Is that use of the name Chandra Shekhar Azad, as you're saying, this kind of... Uh, yeah. Uh, bringing back history or, or reliving uh, that revolutionary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, really interesting questions. Thanks, Mikdad. Um Just on the second one first, maybe. Um, I, I, I actually don't know about the story behind his name, but there is certainly a kind of, um, you know, the, the, the mustache and the kind of uh, charisma of this figure is very much part of that tradition or resonates with that tradition. I guess for me, he's interesting... Chandrasekhar Azad in, in thinking about another figure who has this powerful afterlife in India, which is Ambedkar, right? And this kind of Ambedkarite tradition, which is being very much um, uh, conjured and resuscitated in, in, in India today. And so to see the kind of um, merger of those two ideas of the kind of revolutionary movement of, uh, of Bhagat Singh and his comrades with a kind of Ambedkarite tradition is quite um, uh, exciting. I think. Um, in terms of uh, Shahid, it's, I mean, it's not even just Shahid, it's Shahid Azam, right? Like, the, kind of, there is a, there's a sense that he is the, the kind of uh, premier martyr of the, the tradition, right? Of the anti colonial period. Um, in terms of um, the kind of use, so I think when I showed you that image of Bhagat Singh giving his head to Bharat Mata, but there are other popular images which would um, r use religious tropes from um, the kind of Shia tradition to, to again, point to this idea of martyrdom as something that's much more embedded and much more kind of. Um, so I don't see it in, obviously, Bhagat Singh is writing in a particular time when, um, as a kind of socialist organization, they're committed to a certain sort of secular politics, right? Um, that is seeking to transgress religious boundaries. But in the way that he is received or portrayed, it is very much being like these, these sort of religious traditions from Sikh, from Islam, um, Sikhism from Islam and, and from the kind of more um, 
a, a lot of kind of Sufi tropes as well, moths to a flame, these kind of ideas um, are very much how Bhagat Singh is represented. Um, one thing to maybe say is that, so an interesting side note, and um, which I think, McDud, you you've read parts of this book, so you'll remember, um, Bhagat Singh is, belongs to Lahore, right? Lahore is today part of Pakistan. Bhagat Singh has been allocated to India. He's kind of seen as a, as a hero of, uh, of, of India and not of Pakistan, right? He's kind of written out of that national narrative. And in fact, one of the, there was recently a movement to name a, a, a chalk after Bhagat Singh in Lahore. And one of the opposition to it was that um, a non-Muslim could not be referred to as Shaheed, right? So that was kind of part of the opposition to commemorating Bhagat Singh by a certain segment of the population in, um, in Pakistan. But we also know that looking at this history, how kind of, how much these ideas and traditions mingle. So it's an, an inadequate way to respond to your question, but it's a really good question. Chris, thanks. Hey, Chris. I got very specific two questions sure. that are linked. So first, um, when he was alive, like how did other anti-colonialists perceive him? Because I understand he was against Gandhi's like non-violence approach, but did Gandhi say anything about him either when he was alive or after? Mm -hmm. And then like with Modi, like is he also trying to claim Bhagat Singh? And then how? Because of course like Modi is also, um, you know, sort of embracing this muscular nationalism in many ways with, you know his chest and all that. So like, is he, like, how does he talk about uh, Bhagat Singh specifically? Yeah, so, um, so in terms of, of Gandhi, yeah, there's kind of a direct, I, I mean, Gandhi was very critical of this revolutionary group. He saw them as, um, uh, I mean, he called their, their um, politics as suicidal, right? He said that violence will only bring more violence. He said that, um, by throwing bombs at the British or assassinating police officers, you're only inviting repression, and the British are very good at repression, right? That's what he's saying. Um, and Bhagat Singh and his comrades are challenged. They say Gandhi is out of touch, right? They say that he is not paying attention to history. He's not paying attention to the fact that Lenin has secured this revolution. In, um, in Russia, he's not paying attention to the fact that the Irish are fighting for their freedom through through arms, that this is also happening in uh, other parts of the world, right? Um, so there is a direct uh, debate between them. And there's a famous kind of exchange where Gandhi is critiquing the cult, what he calls the cult of the bomb, the cult of the, the, the bomb as a kind of the, the, the romance of violence. And Bhagat Singh, his organization, responds with the philosophy of the bomb, right? Where they defend their use of, of physical force for a just uh, end, right? But for me, it's interesting because they're appealing to that global history by saying that like, this is how politics is done and Gandhi's unrealistic, right? Um, there is also a suggestion by some historians that Gandhi could have saved the revolutionaries from their execution, right? Um, he could have intervened. And people kind of critique Gandhi for not doing that, but that's not really substantiated by archival documents. I think it's part of a um, an attempt to drive these figures apart in some ways. What interests me, again, I'm kind of rambling a little bit on this, but it's you know it's an important question that Bhagat Singh and Gandhi actually share a lot in their um, appreciation of self-sacrifice and 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 courage and bravery. Right? It's just they have different ideas about force. Uh, and then Modi is, yeah, I mean, he's absolutely, he's, every year there are um, uh, celebrations to mark Bhagat Singh's death anniversary. And Modi has attended some of these functions. He's given speeches. Um, I don't know if he's particularly interested in Bhagat Singh as a figure, but when he does speak about him, it is as a kind of patriotic youth, right? It is as someone who, who died for his, his nation, rather than a revolutionary who was critical of capitalism or, you know, these kind of things. So it is a kind of simplistic idea. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right that he's, he's, he's very much interested in the resuscitation of these figures. Um, Chris, thank you very much. Thanks. Um, two sort of things come to my mind. Has the 
आम आम आदमी पार्टी एडप्ट भगत सिंह इन एनी वे एंड द सेकेंड वन इज वी डिन से एनी थिंग अबाउट भगत सिंह बिफोर पार्टीशन ऑफकोर्स आई एम नॉट अवेयर ऑफ एनी थिंग बट ही मे है and lastly it seems from your presentation that <coughs> every group in india tries to make him part of the establishment so that he doesn't pose any further yeah. challenges yeah which is what uh, you could see i could see manmohan singh and his whole cabinet yeah. uh, in front of the uh, statue and in the lok sabha as you said there is a mm. statue there as well so this is probably in realization that it is a very powerful call hmm. and if it is not sort of uh, put embedded into the establishment it might yeah. still uh, excite people as you know yeah. uh, most of the um, east of india is still still left leaning sure. in a sense yeah yeah thank you three like some really interesting comments there so um just start with jina uh There is a a fragment where he so I mentioned that there was this long conspiracy case um as you might know one of the features of it was a hunger strike so there was a um a uh, kind of very long period where the revolutionaries were on hunger strike for their rights as political prisoners so basically they were being treated as criminals they wanted access to reading materials and uh, a bit more kind of um relief from labor in the prison these kind of things and they went on hunger strike for that and in fact one of the revolutionaries um uh, uh died as a result of the, of the hunger strike um there was a debate in the legislative assembly around these hunger strikes and and jina defended the revolutionaries in saying that um i can't remember the exact words at the moment but it was something like um you know those who are willing to to fast to death they they ha- the hunger striker has a soul right and we have to honor their kind of their courage for this like that they they need to be treated as as human beings rather than um criminals so that's the kind of one um aspect that I know about it and um I, I if that answers your your question um the Aam Aadmi Party they do um they do celebrate again this the the death anniversary of Bhagat Singh there's often like um I know there's been events where they'll kind of attach a celebration around Bhagat Singh to the opening of a you know new infrastructure project in Delhi or something like this right uh but as you know the um aadmi party came out of these india against corruption protests um on the hazare and and these kind of um uh these calls for uh, an ombudsman to to fight corruption in india and these protests um very much centered around honoring bhagat singh's uh um you know struggle and anazar called for a second freedom struggle right he called for a second fight for independence so this is a really good example of how that history is kind of seen to be repeated and if that history if that uh, second freedom struggle is taking place then bhagat singh's struggle needs to be repeated in different ways so um there's a connection there and then yeah i mean your last point is kind of captures really beautifully um one of the arguments that i wanted to make is that there is a desire to um to control bhagat singh's memory and to prevent it from being disruptive and dangerous and so in the book i talk about statues like the one in the lok sabha not necessarily as attempts to promote bhagat singh or to kind of like um to spread his message but actually to control it or to to contain him right so it's just one thought thank you for your comments okay. you know, of course was one of the leading uh, yeah yeah he defended tilak right uh, yeah yeah absolute uh, any final questions otherwise um chris you around for a few minutes afterwards if people want to ask directly sure yeah absolutely uh, thank you, thank you very much thanks um, uh, just a couple of quick announcements uh next week we have dr sura mohammed talking to us about um uh, talking to us about uh, conflict in in somalia um and the week after we have uh, Fatima Manji talking to us about her recent book Hidden Heritage Rediscovering Britain's Lost Love of the Orient so please do come and look forward to seeing you at our future talk thank you very much so a lot <laughs>